Hello, Podicumans, and welcome to the Podicesis Podcast, a podcast about what Christians believe and why it matters. I'm Brett Maddox, and once again, and it's been a while since you've heard from these voices, we are joined by your best friends and the world's greatest tailgaters. It's getting ready for college football oh, season. Man. Alan Kaysen and Jim Morrow. How are you guys doing? It's good man, to see you. Man, listen, you beat me to the punch, man. I was going to say, God is good. And college Amen. football is back, and uh, <laughs> I'm I'm one happy camper. And you know what? For the next football season, here's what I yep. get to say. Yep. Every Saturday, I I'm gonna get to watch the defending national champion Georgia Bulldogs. That's all yes. I gotta say. So there I'm you good. go. I'm good. There so go. college football back, and we're back too, which is which is awesome as well. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, how you doing, bud? I'm fantastic. It's so good to be back. I'm excited about what we're getting started with in this next season of the Podakesis awesome. podcast. I have had so many great conversations uh, mm -hmm. from local church members and people in uh, other local churches um, about what they are experiencing joining us in these conversations in our past episodes. So I'm super grateful to get started with what we have going on next and yes. to spend some time uh, with one of my favorite Twitter follows and yes, one yes. of my favorite uh, uh, scholars and authors we'll talk about yeah. in just a second. Yes. So y you're saying what's next. So let's talk just a briefly about what is next. We are starting season two, which is crazy because season one took us just over two years <laughs> to complete. It was a yeah. long season. Yeah, I it's like it's like era. a little longer than an episode of 24, <laughs> season of 24. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's, should we call this an epic and not a not a season? I, I yeah. don't know. Anyway, so what's next? Well, um, uh, just last year or just this uh, just early this year, a uh, there was a document that was released from the John Wesley Institute, and you can find out about more more about the John Wesley Institute um, at nextmethodism.org, and uh, we'll have all that these links and everything in our show notes. There it is. There wow, it is. Man, I have missed that. Yeah. Mm. But anyway, uh, this document this uh, that came out of a summit um, of over 50 scholars who had gathered together um, called The Faith Once Delivered, and um, it's an awesome, awesome uh, document that really kind of gets to the heart of Christian belief, particularly from a Wesleyan uh, perspective, and the general editor of this document is Dr. Ryan Danker. Um, he is a, a, a scholar, he is a, West, a historian, and um, he is a great Twitter follow. He is a great <laughs> Twitter follow. So, you, um, in fact, um, Dr. Danker, uh, before I turn it over to you, for the long, I'm, I'm just going to admit this because of as uh, all the stuff you say about uh, uh, the Anglican Church, the uh, the the um, uh, the Wesleys, and all. There was a moment there I thought you were actually British for a long time with all the references you made, and then it took me a while. I was like, oh wait, he's not. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Danker, welcome to uh, the podcast. Well, thank you. And, and I appreciate being thought of as British. That's fine. Um, <laughs> I, I do tend to go over there on a regular basis and uh, and just laugh it all up. So it's, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I think my house is probably a shrine to the monarchy, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's what it was. I was just because you talk about the monarchy so much. I was like, oh, my gosh, I think this guy is uh, is British. This is amazing. So anyway, uh, that's I'm awesome. a monarchist in Washington, D.C. Like, oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so do you celebrate the Fourth of July or is that just a day of uh, mourning? Is that, the day guys of mourning? Is that a day of grief and mourning? <laughs> Give the guy some peace. What's the 4th of July? What? No. <laughs> I don't know. Actually, you know, if, if you don't celebrate the 4th of July here in Washington, you're stupid. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. We do. Uh, yeah, we have fun doing that. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us your pursuit, your, uh, your scholarly um, 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 interest, all of that. Okay, yeah. Um, so, I'm, I mean, I'm a Wesley scholar, and I, I – well, I, sh I should clarify. I study both the brothers. Yeah. Um, that's probably mm. when, the fact that I actually pay attention to Charles is probably why you get the <laughs> <laughs> the long ignored child. The long ignored. I know. Although, I, if you may have noticed today, I did post one of Charles Wesley's scathing critiques of his brother. Yeah. Um, yes. And even gave you a hymn tune to sing it by. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> It's a it's a it's a good thread. You should follow. Yeah, oh, it's great fun, great fun. Um, 
So I, I'm a historian. I mean, I do have some degrees in theology, but I'm really a historian. And um, I've taught, well, I taught, I was a professor for 10 years and um, I'm now in the think tank world as it were, and uh, enjoying not grading papers. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, and yeah, so the, the John West Institute was founded last year on August 1st. Oh, how about that? Um, also, and I've been directing that. And it's, it's a wild ride, it really is. Um, it's a it's a wild time to be anything co- connected to Methodism in this country for sure. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and so, but my, my passion is to tell people about the Wesleys. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually stay away from the polemics, but uh, except 18th century polemics, I'll get involved. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that's that's what I do. I'm writing a couple books. Um, yeah. I do. I mean, I do have a life other than just writing and talking. But yeah, in the, <laughs> for the sake of this conversation, that's yeah. what I do. <laughs> <laughs> that that's awesome. So, uh, what precipitated the formation of the John Wesley Institute? You know, it was really just looking at the state of Methodism during this time of what I call realignment. Mm. Um, you know, regardless of what anybody thinks of the issues and there, and it's plural, if anybody tells you it's singular, they're not sure. Um, facing the UMC, um, those issues are being faced by Wesleyans, regardless of what denomination they're in, because so many of us have not been taught the basics and the depth of our own tradition. And so finding a way to communicate the riches of the Wesleyan tradition um, in a scholarly way, yes, but in an accessible way. Yes. That's the point of the John Wesley Institute. Gotcha. I, mean, I mean, I've got my own academic projects and things, um, but at the same time, the point of the Institute is to reach the faithful mm. with faithful teaching. Oh, my. So, so that's, that's what precipitated all this. And it's, it's a wonderful formational effort. Um, you know, we're not getting involved with the fights necessarily. Right. Um, you, you get you get wounded by some of the fights because you talk about Jesus, <laughs> you know, um, and you talk about Methodism, and it's dangerous to talk about Methodism at all at the moment. Mm-hmm. But we're just pressing ahead and saying, look, this is the tradition we've received, and it's rich and it's beautiful, mm-hmm. and it's uh, it points to to a, a life that is whole, mm-hmm. made whole in Christ. And so that's that, what that makes my heart sing, and I think that's part of the reason that we're drawn to the work you're doing with the Wesley Institute and um, the Faith Once Delivered, um, the riches of the historical tradition and the riches of Wesleyanism. Um, man, you just kind of gave me a spirit-filled moment there, Dr. Yeah. Decker. Um, I do want to point out that Brett has, he's altering his speech patterns in your presence. He's trying to impress you with uh, fancy talk about, pardon me, what precipitated the formation of the John Wesley Institute. Well, how'd y'all do it? I, with, that, with that said, um, how'd y'all get that done? <laughs> we're from we're from georgia yeah south um, georgia. Yeah. i would love to hear about so i'm looking now at the faith once delivered document i'd love to hear about um why this and and why now and and tell us about the formation of what we're going to be spending some time on in the podakesis podcast yeah so when it, in periods of realignment i'm gonna stick with that term i like that's it a, that's a good term it's a great term yeah well i mean it i'll say this <laughs> united <laughs> Methodists need to be nice to each other <laughs> amen amen <laughs> just be nice <laughs> um so uh in times when when there is a change there's adjustment there are new structures emerging new avenues being presented people often look back to the sources Hmm. um and and this has happened every time there's renewal in the church as well um in fact you know some historians say every time you see revival in the church you'll note that they were looking back to the church fathers Hmm. there's there's a there's actually a, a link it's not the only link but there is a link between revival and looking back to the fathers but but what we see right now in methodism is you know the next methodism whatever that means 
is emerging. And so people are saying, all right, what does it mean to be a Wesleyan? Yeah. What do we believe? Um, where And where can I find this information that I can share with the people in the pews? You know, not, not in an academic class, although that, you know, academia has great value. I'm not putting down academia. Um, but how do you take the riches of that tradition that's often in, encased in academic books hmm. and bring that to people in the pews in a way that is accessible, that is... Um, clear and is faithful that's what precipitated this particular um this particular effort and and there's also there was also great concern that as the next methodism emerges we don't want the faithful to forget that there are you know there there are many many faithful wesleyan scholars in this country and they are a, a huge resource Yes, a huge resource. And sometimes uh, in the formation of various things and institutions re recently, a number of us have been concerned that that scholarly voice hasn't been there. And so we wanted to say, look, here's what it presents. So there was that as well. That, that was also an undercurrent. Um, now, the, the project, you know, you, you launch any project and it's going to morph. It's going to take on its own life. It's going to do it's, it's going to end up being looking different than you think it will. Um, we first start, started talking about this, goodness, maybe three years ago, wow. three and a half years ago. Um, and uh, it was great. It was, I still remember a conversation in the Nazarene Theological Seminary Library. It was, it was me, Mark Tooley, Joy Moore, and Steve Rankin. Mm. And we were sitting there. We were at the Wesleyan Theological Society meeting, the last, the last one they had before the pandemic hit. And... Um, this was, there had been talk previous before that, but this is really when it started. I uh, really, when it kind of really started. Um, what, when was that? That was early March, 2020. So it was right before we all went into lockdown. Oh, wow. Days, <laughs> yeah. days, 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 days. Yeah. Well, it was days. And you know, what's funny is that <laughs> two days before I had inadvertently been in the same room with the first COVID case in Washington, DC. Oh, oh. you're kidding. No, no. Oh, man. Thankfully, it was a big room, and I got nowhere near him. But <laughs> oh my! <laughs> wow. Otherwise, oh. I could have spread COVID to every Wesley scholar in the. In the <laughs> there would be no next method. <laughs> I can't think too much about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my providence, God. providence. Sorry, right, sorry, Jim. Didn't mean. <laughs> Good. I had I had a moment. <laughs> I mean, none of us knew what it was at all. But, yeah, seriously. Um, anyway, I got diverted there. You're good. We do it all the time. This is this is welcome to the podcast. <laughs> good, good. So, okay, what's, what was what? What else did you want from that question, though? Um, you know, it's fascinating to me. Just an observation. Um, this this document, for one, uh, Brad mentioned there's 50 Wesleyan scholars. I I love the fact that your work and others are trying to bring bring that forward into the mainstream because yeah. it's sometimes been hard to hear voices in the Methodist tradition um, that you can, you know, resource with and dialogue with and bring to the church and talk about and small groups and Bible studies to help people. Yeah. Um, and I'm so grateful, not only to recognize myself, look at all these amazing gifted people well, they're, and they're also, not. They're, it's not only the Calvinist tradition and the and the new Reformed and Restless that have scholarship and yeah. things to say. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say too the diversity, and I'm not even just talking about men and women or you know racial or whatever, but also the the um, the the school diversity because you know something like this there would be kind of a is this coming out of just one or two schools you know um but no you've got schools here that might actually surprise people that are represented in a document that is like this and i love that i think that just goes to show that um the uh the faith once delivered that that kind of um wesleyan orthodoxy um is out there in a variety of uh, of schools it is, although Brett, I'll, I'll not to put not to dump water on it like Charles Wesley used to do on people who got rowdy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let's bring that back too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we're seeing a shift already 
uh, where certain schools are becoming exclusive. Mm -hmm. Sure. One way or the other. Um, now, some of them have always been that way, and that's part of their ethos. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the number of traditionalist scholars left in the 13 official seminaries, if you mm -hmm. take United out of the picture, mm -hmm. it's a very small number. Yeah. Oh. And um, now Duke has some, but um, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's upsetting. It's very upsetting because so even some of the people on the list that you mentioned, um, have now moved over to one of the more traditionalist minded seminaries. Yeah. Yeah. And so you've got places, well, like Claremont, I mean, Jack is no longer at Claremont. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and of course he, you know, he was the only traditionalist out there forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and anyway, so there, there's some of that going on. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so real you, quick, I, well, I, I have to make another observation. This is why I'm on the podcast, uh, just yeah. to interrupt and say things. Um, you had mentioned uh, the beauty and, and richness of our tradition. And I mean, this document is called The Faith Once Delivered. I heard Kevin Watson one time refer to the basic core of the Christian faith as the, um, the well-worn path. Um, and you know what, it's not just like, Hey, you need to learn the basics, like some kind of academic mental exercise. What I have experienced retouching on the basic questions of God, Trinity, salvation, all of this is it's beautiful and it rings in the heart, like a tuning fork. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not just like, we're not just doing this because, we think people need to know the basics so they can agree with me. It's there's deep beauty mm -hmm. in what's been passed down. And so that's another reason I'm grateful. Um, and so thank you for bringing some of this work. Absolutely. I mean, you could just say it this way, the gospel works. Oh, um, you know, it's, I still, I, I remember I, I had some students, uh, they, I brought, I, I brought them to an event with a, a Catholic historian, um, uh, Robert Lewis Wilkin, who's one of my absolute favorites ever. Um, and, and I, one of my students asked him, um, you know, what should we focus on in our, in our parish ministry? And I love the fact that this progressive Methodist was asking this really traditionalist Catholic, this question. And I was curious, what is he going to say? And he said, tell them the story. Mm. He said, don't try to dress it up. Don't try to put anything on it. Tell them the story. Oh my. And, um, it was it was this beautiful clear moment where it's like yes mm -hmm. you know tell me the old old story it works wow. not because of us it's because of the holy spirit mm -hmm. so raise my hand like a pentecostal there you go <laughs> um, <laughs> well a a alan and i've even talked uh some about how we feel like we're better preachers and pastors because of our locking in we even with this very like going through the catechism um, being, you know, taking a moment to to lock in um, has, I think, I know it's for me, um, and we've, like I said, we've talked, uh, made made us better um, at the calling we are we we have. So that's beautiful. Yeah. Now, so as a historian, let, let me, and I, I get historians are they they tell him what his historians are. Will you tell? Will you tell <laughs> no, the historian what no. historians are, please? <laughs> <laughs> the historians I've ever talked to, they 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 like to just kind of lock in with their specialty. So I I get it, their 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 area, and I get that. Uh, but as a historian, like one of the things I've seen, just kind of in wider Christendom, not just in and specifically in the West, it seems I like I like your word realignment here. Not, um, I I wonder if there is kind of a movement happening in the Western world anyway, with uh, with Christianity among different traditions, be it Calvinist, Wesleyan, um, whatever, because it just seems like there is this something, something that, uh, you know, in 500 years, church historians will look back and write about this period of whatever this is, like they talk about the Reformation, or like they talk about, um, you know, other large epics of time. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you sense that as well? I mean, kind of in what you're seeing? Um, I, I know that's kind of a leading question, but that's what I do. Uh, honestly, no. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Never mind. Little, makes, you're making us sound a little too big and important. Yeah, I'm uh, out. It's, it's um, 
at this point, I, I mean, I think, yeah, there's, there's major cultural clashes in the West with, with traditional Christianity. That's, that's taking place. I think we're also seeing Christianity in the West is, either, is moving either toward Catholicism or Pentecostalism. I think that's something we're seeing. Um, mm. But in terms of like world altering events, um, I hesitate. I really hesitate. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the last, the last world altering event that came out, especially out of American Christianity, was Azusa Street. Mm. And, um, and of course, as Methodists, we don't like to admit that because, um, you know, that was one of our former buildings and we tried to stay away from all that noise, um, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Don't tell, don't tell Dale Coulter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, he knows. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, 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 has, I just hesitate. Um, yeah. And I, well, and I, I, yeah, and I apologize reason, for the question. I was just thinking yeah, about, like, yeah, fine. like that's something we say, like, fifty years from now, you can look back and decide, right? Or, or five hundred, maybe. Um, <laughs> oh, I like it better. I like the long haul. I like the long yeah. haul. Yeah. I mean, that's the that's the thing. Um, I don't know. I the other reason I hesitate is because I don't want to give any contemporary Methodist ammunition to think mm. that they're extraordinary. Oh um, wow, that's a good word. Because that was the excuse Wesley used to make innovations. Wow. But we always forget that that's his excuse is based on the fact that there was actually a transatlantic revival going on that was sweeping millions of people into it. And and yet all of a sudden we're like, well, Wesley did it, so I can do it. No. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> um that so that's 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 another part of my hesitancy. Um, oh, wow, that you just gobsmacked me, and I like that. I'm gonna write. I'm gonna write a few of these things down. Yeah. Wow. So, Alan, you're not extraordinary, brother. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, this is this is uh, this has been known by a lot of people, including me, for a very long time. <laughs> um, so, so um, well, I, I, go, go ahead, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. No, man. Okay, I'm going. Say, for um, instance, let, me, let me just say, like, for yeah. you know, the, the founding of the GMC is a historic event. Mm -hmm. Sure. But founding a new denomination is not extraordinary. Yeah. It's been done before. Well, many, many, many times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At least four times. <laughs> At least four times in the last minute. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think I, I know we wanted to talk to you a little bit about the structure of the document itself um, and how it was put together and the choices that you made. Um, and I, I, particularly around the idea of, uh, the image and, and the image that we were made in and, and so forth. Um, before we get to that, and I'll let these, some of these guys, these other two guys maybe handle some of that, but I had a question. So we're moving from the catechism that we just did, uh, Wesley's revision of the shorter catechism. That is a, um, like a lot of catechisms is question and answer. So it's question, and answer, question, and answer, teaching the faith. And, and you, and, and this document covers some of the, all, most of these foundational truths that um, a catechism would, would, would cover. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's not done in a question answer format. It's done in sort of a paragraph point by point. It all builds on each other, much like a catechism does. Mm -hmm. Is there any discussion and, and how, and, and is there any discussion about that and, and how you were going to structure the document itself? Not just what was in it, but how you structured it and put it together. Yeah, in fact, you know, so Wendy Muller Saib um, has actually, well, she, she said this to me at the, at the summit itself, so maybe she's forgotten it, but um, <laughs> she said when she's done with her PhD, she'd love to put this in some kind of a curricular format. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to hold her to that. Now all, all your listeners can hold her to Now it. it's official. Yes. Now uh, it's official. <laughs> done. She, she just got voluntold. That's right. Well, she's wonderful and she can do that easily. Um, so, so what happened was, you know, the, the, we, we started what was called the list and it was only called the list. Cause that's what I titled the document on my computer. Um, it wasn't some, you know, highly secretive, you know, thing. Um, but it, you were it, carrying in on a Halliburton and just had it uh, 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 handcuffed to your, uh, <laughs> although we have to say we never let the, the list out, um, mainly given the, the polemical state of Methodism at the moment, mm -hmm. um, which is sad, but anyway, um, what, what, what developed is, is 
is as this thing grew, I realized I cannot run this on my own. In fact, mm-hmm. I don't want this to be about me. Mm, yes. Um, sure. But I had a lot to do with that document. Um, but the reality is it's not my document. It belongs to every person who signed it. Um, and so quickly I realized I needed what was became known as the drafting committee. And the drafting committee was uh, a group of, of scholars and even a bishop who is a scholar, Scott Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, we started meeting regularly to, the first thing we did was said, okay, what are we writing exactly? Oh, that's good, yeah. Um, what's the trajectory? What's the theme? What are the sections? What are the subsections? And over the course of a few meetings all over Zoom, we, um, we started to craft what we call the skeletal outline of the document that you have now. Now, we did not write it. The, the, the drafting committee did not write the document. Mm-hmm. Um, but in order to communicate with the larger group, what we had discussed on the drafting committee, and by the way, I, I could probably rattle the names. Do you want, you want the names? <laughs> I'm trying to think, I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, so Scott Jones, Joy Moore, Jonathan Powers, yeah. Bill Arnold, um, Tammy Grimm, Ken Collins. Oh yeah, we know Ken. I'm going to leave somebody out. Um, we can put it in the show notes. There we go. Yeah. We'll do that. I'll look it up. I think that's. I think that's it. Um, it was a good group. Um, and what we did is the conversations that we had amongst that group, which, as you can tell, was not that big, by the way. Um, <laughs> And it was intentionally not that big. Oh, Warren Smith was on that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <Warren Smith>. yeah. <laughs> I knew I was leading somebody out. Um, each person within that group, not all of them, but almost all of them, agreed to be a co-leader with one of the sections of the document when the summit came together. So that each section, and there were five at the summit, um, was, was co-led by somebody on the drafting committee who understood the larger conversations we were having, and then another scholar that they invited themselves to, to, to be their co-leader, mm. because we also wanted to bring in more voices into leadership. Yes. Uh, this was really important to, to spread out the leadership, because if you look at the list of people who signed that, they're all leaders. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is right. A- this is a gathering of chiefs. This, you know, right. everybody in the kitchen was a chef. There was no, wow. no, no one uh, at that summit was sidelined at all. Um, and it, by the way, it was one of the, mo- the most joy filled gatherings wow. any awesome. of us have ever been to. Oh, wow. wow. That's awesome. No, that just makes my heart yeah. sing based on some of the Methodist gatherings we've recently been a part of. <laughs> Let's move well, on from that. <laughs> well, well, just, well, that's, I think that goes to show this, this how the spirit was in this. Um, you got a bunch of leaders and chiefs who um, were able to work together to come up with this document, um, and that you, you know, you, as you say, you, it was the most joy filled experience you've had. I just think that speaks to the work of the Holy Spirit in in this. So. Yeah, no, it really does. Um, and so what we did is we ended up kind of like, it was, I guess it was kind of like a draft, but we went through the list of people who had said they wanted to come to the summit, the drafting committee did. And we said, okay, where, where is this person's expertise? Where do we think that they can best serve at the summit? And so everyone was appointed to a group. Now, we, I also told them, look, if you don't want to be in that group, we'll move you. This is not, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It, may be, it may be Bishop Jones who put you there, but it's not an appointment, you know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll tell you, we didn't have anyone balk at their appointment. Wow. That's awesome. oh, man. Wow. Um, everyone was excited and happy, but from what I could tell now, you know, who knows? I'm sure there was, <laughs> maybe they didn't tell me. Um, Don't worry. We'll have the minority report on next episode. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny because there were some debates in the groups. Um, I was in group three. So um, Scott Jones and, and Wendy Muller Seib were, um, were the group leaders for group three. And group three did scripture and tradition. Okay. 
And I had, if I had any input at all, it's in the tradition section. I know you're shocked, right? Absolutely. Um, shocked. <laughs> shocked, I tell you. <laughs> so, but most of the time I was actually just running around trying to make sure everything was functioning because I was running the summit. Um, but um, anyway, we can get back to the document more than the running. Of the summit. So let me, no, I think it's fascinating. So uh, a couple of things. So you've got these main sections, um, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you're really using this image motif. You have creation, the image given and marred, mm -hmm. revelation, the image revealed, salvation, the image restored, church, life in the image, and then at the end, the fullness of time, the glorified image. And so as we walk through this with our listeners over the next period of time, we're really going to be digging in there. So the two things that I have interested in, and you can take them however you want to, is so there's a lot of what you would call um, just regular universal Christian belief in here, mm -hmm. and yet we have a Wesleyan witness. So one of the things I wanted to ask you is, tell me, tell me about why it's important to have a Wesleyan witness, and then I want to, and then I want to eventually touch base on um, this use of the image of God as the structure. So I can break that down later, uh, more palatable question, but if you just wanted to give us a sense. Yeah. Okay. So why a Wesleyan witness and why image? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, we, Wesleyanism is rightly understood within the church Catholic. Yes. And I think if you take it out of that, you actually no longer have a Wesleyan movement. Correct. Um, yes. I was, I've, I've always told my students, the reason we can actually emphasize the experiential in the Christian faith is because we're grounded on the faith once delivered. Mm. It, as long as your feet are grounded on orthodoxy or, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 the what's the, what was Tom Odin's term for this? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, oh man. Yep. Um, I can hear him saying it. Well, <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. As long yes. as you've got the, the basics, <laughs> then then you can you can be open to the experiential in a way that will not uh, twist and contort the message of the faith to our experience. Mm. Right? That I mean that is the danger, right? If if you take if you take let's let's use Wesley's term, scriptural Christianity, which you know, let, let, of course, let's be more like Billy Abraham and say the canon was bigger than scripture. Um, hmm. <laughs> if, if you take the, you know, the creeds, the scriptures, the, the, the ancient church, the primitive Christian witness, and you ground yourself there and you say, look, you will experience this in your life. That's a holistic Wesleyan approach. Wow. Um, if we say my faith or my experience as a 21st century American Anglophile living in Washington, D.C., um, determines my faith. And all of a sudden, I've actually contorted it into something else. So why, are we, why we, do we want a Wesleyan witness to the faith once delivered? It's to actually make Wesleyans Wesleyans again. Oh. Um, that, that's really, really important. So, yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, I was talking to somebody the other day and they were using the word orthodox. And I said, do you mean somebody can say the creed without crossing their fingers? Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sometimes you need to define the term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And that's yeah. what we're talking about here. Um, in fact, if you can say the, Ni the Nicene Creed without, you know, wincing, you can read this document and probably agree with 99% of it. Yeah. Um, but the Wesleyan emphases that you find in it uh, particularly related to, um, you know, we, we believe that salvation is offered to all. We believe God is calling all, or I love, I love Wesley's term. He talked about provenient grace as, as the wooing of the father, mm -hmm. father mm -hmm. wooing us to himself. Yep. Um, you, you know, the, the salvation section is very Wesleyan. <laughs> yeah, it is. In fact, it was so Wesley centric when we first got it. I was like, okay, guys, we're going to need to put some Bible verses in here. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, Wesley derived it from the scripture, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. But you know, they, they were, they were, they were doing great work, you know, yeah. and I wasn't, it wasn't a critique. I was like, okay, this is good. Let's, let's add a bit to it. Um, 
<laughs> it's funny because we, we would add Wesley quotes to other sections, but we added Bible stuff to the <laughs> other <laughs> Um, what else? I mean, there's, there's, there's this overwhelming optimism that Wesleyanism brings. Yes, it does. That pervades this document. Can you, can you, can you explain that for just a second? Because I, I want to be able to capture that thought before you continue. A pervading optimism mm -hmm. and Wesleyanism. Yeah, I mean, we really do think grace will transform the world. Mm. Amen. Um, Amen. Amen. It is a dynamic mm. power. Right. Um, that, that's actually, been, gosh, that, talk about a soapbox. That has been my soapbox for 20 years now. I want Methodists to know how to define the word grace. Yes, and I, I would like you to help us right now. Well, I'll give you, <laughs> I'll give you Wesley's <laughs> definition. It's easy. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Ah. And, 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 and I don't know why, but Methodists talk about grace ad nauseum, you know? It grace and casseroles. I mean, it's. it's <laughs> uh, in fact, I've had a grace casserole listen, before. Listen, I've, I've experienced grace through casseroles. Thank you very much. There you uh, go. So. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, like 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 grace is a uh, like grace is nicety. Yeah, or they or actually, great. or they adopt. Okay, so what's weird is a lot of them just adopt a reform perspective. It's unmerited favor, and I'm like, mm, okay, that's nice. Or they'll go all Eastern Orthodox on us. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And they'll, and they'll say it is the Holy Spirit. I'm like, come on. Um, it's, it's, uh, so I'm writing a new book right now on Wesley's context. And I got, I got a little spunky in the book. The editors probably won't allow me to do it. But um, uh -huh. <laughs> I essentially talk about how people have tried to dress up Wesley, either as Martin Luther and, you know, some kind of Reformation garb, or they try to dress him up as some kind of Eastern Orthodox cleric with a beard. And he doesn't belong in either. Um, and see, that's what we're seeing when, with this definition of grace is that he gets it right from the prayer book, by the way. I mean, he's an Anglican, yeah. so get it from the prayer book. And you look at the collect for grace in the daily office. Yes. And it never uses the word grace. It only speaks about God's governance and God's power so that we might actually live a life that is whole. That's a Wesleyan view of mm. grace. Mm. Anyway, that's, that's my soapbox. Okay. It was I a good soapbox. It. I loved it. That's, that's like the high quality soapbox that that guy does ads for on YouTube. That kind of soap. That's the kind of box that was. Oh, no, I, <laughs> but but oh. to get back to what you're saying, Jim, though, that's why we're optimistic. Mm -hmm. the, I see. That's such a beautiful way to, you know, enter into a conversation about Wesleyanism in such a simple and potent way. So I'm thankful for that. Tell me, tell me why, um, not why, but so because the structure of things matters to me. Mm -hmm. um, a majority of this document, especially as it gets, I mean, about humanity and, and our relationship with God, you're using, the team is using the image motif yeah. all the way through. So it's kind of a way to set up our time through it. Tell us a little bit about not just why, but how that helps us. So that's one of the core teachings of John Wesley is that sanctification is the restoration of the image of God in man. Right, right. Mm. And Thank you, Jesus. Yes. And it, and it, and it's, you know, just, just think of, um, you know, gosh, I'm blanking on which I think it was Athanasius. Um, you know, glory of God is man fully alive. Um, or um, other church fathers, you know, uh, God became man so that man could become like God. It, mm. It's speaking to wholeness. It's speaking to to our our flourishing as human beings, as God intended. Um, it's you know it's it's definitely not the um, don't smoke, uh, drink, cuss, dance, or or date women who do right. It's not it's not that <laughs> legalism. <laughs> so awesome. You know, well, you know, I was raised Nazarene, so I, yeah. I got to I know you want that. Yeah. <laughs> There's some good Nazarenes, I'm telling you. Yeah, you know, I, I still tell people I, I refuse to dance. I probably can't, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I just never learned how. I just, you know, my, my mother wouldn't approve. Um, <laughs> actually, she wouldn't care now, but I'll still use that excuse. Um, <laughs> Anyway, it's where was it going with all that? So the image is <laughs> it's the restoration of our life in Christ oh. to be made whole, to be perfect, which you know is not this static, uh, you know, 
I've, I've never liked Plato. His idea of perfection as this static thing that if you change anything, it's wrong is horrible. And I don't know why people mm-hmm. put that on. Think like Aristotle. <laughs> Um, to be perfect is to be made whole, mm. to, actually, to actually be who God intended us to be. And so, and that's the message. See, that's the beautiful, optimistic, and, well, I'll just say it again, beautiful message that we have. Wow. And, and that's what Wesleyans need to talk about after we stop talking about the things that are splitting us up at the moment. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about the wholeness and the promise that we have in a God who is wooing us to himself yeah. out of this overabundance of love yeah. that will transform us, not into machines, but into what we are actually intended to be. Amen. Listen, that's what, you know, I was saved in uh, the Methodist church when I was 16, but growing in my discipleship, that's what kept me in this Wesleyan motif was this idea of transformation. Yeah. Yeah. That I don't, I'm not some, I don't know, uh, covered up version of my old self. I'm actually a new creation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's uh, that that's been life changing for me, um, absolutely. And I love that simple grace is the power of the Holy Spirit, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I'm with you. I, 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 you know, Wesley gets, you know, he's a, you know, he was a guy who was a student of the Reform- Reformation, and I get that, and he was a, and the, and the Orthodox, I get, that. but he just had his feet in it. He, he, he was a student of it. That doesn't mean that was him. He was an Anglican. So, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I went off on some poor soul on Twitter the other day. Um, <laughs> I don't yeah. believe that happens on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, I don't know who it was, but I, I, he was trying to tell me that Wesley's Anglicanism was incidental. Huh. And I'm going, uh, what? I, I was, it's, I want it, whoever this is, I want to take you to England. Yeah. <laughs> right. Even now, right. Anglicanism is not incidental to English life. All no. pervasive. No. It's all pervasive. It is a national church. Um, and in, and in, you know, 1725 Oxford, where John Wesley is imbibing all the, the high churchmen and all the church fathers read through the Caroline Divines at Tory Oxford, surrounded by and, inf- you know, informed by the church, least of, least of all the influences of his, of his father. Um, you know, this guy, <laughs> who, by the way, Samuel Wesley was not as bad as people think he was. Okay. People need to study him. Um you know, Wesley lived and breathed in the Church of England. Yeah. And it's 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 a beautiful tradition that I think sometimes we forget exists because it's the very air and water in which he lived. It wasn't, you know, it, it's not a denomination. Right. It, yeah. It's a culture. Right. And so right. we often miss that. Um, I mean, C.S. Lewis could simply describe it as mere Christianity, which, by the way, that's Lewis was talking about Anglicanism most of the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we're all like, oh, it's just Christianity. Well, yeah, but it's the English Christian. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's another. But so- one of the things great. I do do love about Wesley is he did he did study the Reformation. He did have sure. his he did understand the Orthodox, uh, the big O Orthodox Church. He, yeah. and I think that when you talk about Wesleyanism being, um, uh, you can't take it out of the Church Catholic. Yeah. And that is that is why is because he had a. Catholic vision, like a you know understanding of his faith, right? right. But it's yeah. also like this. Just think of it this way: if you try to pre- pretend that Martin Luther wasn't German, you won't get him either. Right. right. Exactly. One hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. You know. One hundred percent. Or that's a good word. Forget that Calvin was a French exile. You'll never understand. Yeah. That's right. right. Um, that's right. John Wesley was English. Very, right. very, very English. <laughs> so. Um, let me ask you this, uh, and this is out on Twitter all the time, and yeah. no one defines it. And Uh-oh. I want to define. I, I don't even know if, and I'm I've been a pastor for you know a long time. I don't. Uh, how would you define what it means to be Wesleyan? Um, because you you know here here's the deal. You'll hear it from all points. You know, on progressive side, traditionalist side, centrist side, whatever, that's not Wesleyan, or that's not Wesleyan, or that's not Wesleyan, that's not Wesleyan. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to know is, how is Wesleyan being defined? Yeah, that's that's difficult. Um, 
I mean, a Wesleyan is somebody is a Wesley is somebody who walks with John Wesley as they follow Jesus. That's yeah, that's, that's a Wesleyan. Um, it doesn't mean they always agree with John Wesley. In fact, they might like Charles Moore. <laughs> um, <coughs> Ryan, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey guys, as a as a person, trust me, you'd much rather hang out with Charles. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> But um, so there, but there are various streams. So um, Dennis Campbell, you know, wrote wrote wonderful books about this. Uh, talked about the Wesleyan stream and how it expands and contracts and and takes in new ideas. And it's still Wesleyan. I, you know, I'm. I remember when I when I first started grad school, um, I thought you know Wesleyan was somebody who believed in entire sanctification and the real presence of Christ in the sacrament of the Eucharist. And if you didn't believe in either one of those, you obviously were not a West. Mm -hmm. And my advisor just kind of looked at me, David Hampton, he smiled. Um, (laughs) It's, it's a lot more. Yeah. If if you're going to be an originalist Wesleyan, you will hold to those two things, but you'll also hold to a lot of other things as well. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to be a Wesleyan? It means to be a part of this large cantankerous family whose teachings can be traced to the revival in which the Wesley brothers were a part. That's, I'm sorry, it's, I'm sorry, it's so elusive. <laughs> no, it's but not that's, really. That's, I mean, you, you said, you said someone who walks with John Wesley as they follow Christ, essentially. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a nice starting point to a conversation. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and I like that from, from, from Bill Quick, you know, mm-hmm. uh, William Kellen Quick, was one of the great preachers of Methodism in the 20th century. And he said, to, I still right. remember, the man could convert people by reading the phone book just with his voice. Oh. Um, <laughs> he was one of those. <laughs> and he stood in front of a class at this in Divinity School and he was so serious and he says, we point to Wesley as he points to Christ. And if he ever does not, we set him aside. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's a pretty good word. That's pretty that good. Is a, that is so, a good word. Yeah. yeah. Those who are going to be watching our uh, brand new video uh, version of our <laughs> podcast, we have our podcast up on YouTube and they're audio only. And we're going to see if we're not uh, too ugly this episode. Ryan looks great. But oh. <laughs> uh, to put it up here, you're going to have seen me probably nodding and looking like I've been kind of in awe. This, it inspires me and probably why we're doing a podcast. Um, Ryan, just to talk about these basic things of the Christian faith and to really talk about the beauty of the Wesleyan way of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to ask you if you would kind of give a word to our listeners as we go into future episodes, because what we're going to do is we're going to walk with the faith once delivered, and we're going to talk about these beautiful tenets of our faith that have been handed down to us from a Wesleyan witness. As we do that, nearly article by article, um, Ryan, what, what would you say is an encouragement and a blessing to those who will follow? Because believe it or not, tons of people will be listening. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, I, I want them to know that we wrote this for them. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, I think one of the, it was a joy-filled gathering because we, we gathered scholars together who were in agreement about the faith. And so they weren't fighting about basic things, uh. but also they had, there was this great desire to reach the faithful and to communicate with them in such a way that would actually build up their faith. Hmm. And would, and, you know, I remember one scholar told me that she read this document and she said, she said, this is a beautiful description. She said, I felt the Holy spirit when I read this document because it ultimately points to the one we want you to be in relationship with. Yes. Yes. Um, Every aspect of it is just, and and by the way, the whole, the whole enterprise was bathed in prayer and worship. We had four worship services in the course of two days, (laughs) full, beautiful worship services. And so all of our work was, was built with prayer and worship and with the faithful in mind. And, and this document was produced out of that for the people in the pews. 
Um, and, and, it, and it was designed at, at a, you know, for this time in, in the life of the Wesleyan movement, where we really think we need to equip people with the faith that Christ himself gave to his apostles and nothing, you know, no variation from that in such a way that they can actually embrace it, read it, understand it and share it. Mm. So that's, that's what this document is. And it, and it points to the, to the promise of, of, of God that, you know, I, I love, I love first Thessalonians, right. Um, you know, God of peace sanctify you entirely. Right. And then, and then he lists out all the, all the way, just in case you don't understand the word entirely. It's like every <laughs> part of you. <laughs> yes. Oh. You know, so that you might be ready to greet Christ when he comes, but then we, we don't stop there. Keep reading the next verse. He who promises this is faithful, faithful. Yeah. and he will do it. And so, and that, that promise, both of, of God's desire to make us whole and his promise to, to do it, it runs throughout this document. Mm -hmm. And so, and so it's, it's really a wonderful thing. And, I, and I'm, I've been so excited to hear people around the world, in fact, who are reading this and I'm not, not scholars um, rank and file and, you know, people who are experts in their own profession, <laughs> right. But well, they're doing what they're doing um, and they get this document and it, and it's, and it's building up their faith. So. Mm. Amen. And I, and I so pray awesome. as we meditate together and in, in the silly ways that we will with all the fun we have with all of our uh, Potokesis community, that that will be our experience too. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, um, Ryan, this has been awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Like, uh, just a blessing. Like, I'm ex Absolutely. so excited about this. Um, um, and so... Um, I might uh, even yeah. go get a spot of tea afterwards. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, hey, Ryan, how can people connect with you uh, through social media? I will say you are an incredible Twitter follow. So if people want oh. to, uh, uh, you know, have some fun, <laughs> how can they and, follow you? And, and some enlightenment and inspiration. Yes, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, follow me on Twitter. It's what what is it? Uh, Ryan and Danker is my okay. handle. Um, it's uh, yeah, I I I enjoy Twitter. I it, <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a glorious dumpster fire. Um, yes. <laughs> but you know, you also make it what you want. I mean, I don't. I don't really respond to people who troll. I don't, you know, yeah. I don't play with that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I've actually, you know, it's amazing. It's, I've made friends on that thing. Um, you know, I've, and, and uh, it, even friends that I visit in England, there you go. Yeah, it, there you uh, go. Um, <laughs> but um, also, if you want to keep up with the John Wesley Institute, yes, said nextmethodism.org. I should tell you, we've got, we have another document coming out in the fall. Um, called a Wesleyan social witness. Ooh. Um, we gathered. Really? 12. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's almost done. And Grant Miller from Northwest Nazarene university and I are the, are co-editing that. Um, this was a, we were really intentional this time to, to, to spread out amongst the Wesleyan family. Um, and so we brought 12 people to Washington DC for a mini summit and we put together this, it's a 12 page document. And it just speaks to how Wesleyans can begin to think like Wesleyans in the public square. Wow. Wow. And that'll mm. come out in the fall. Awesome. We have a conference actually on Anglicanism in the public square that will be in Washington, DC, late October, an international gathering of scholars uh, coming. It's a wonderful thing. Anyway, you can find that on the website too. So that's, yes. that's going to be a lot of fun. And we'll have all that linked in the uh, in our show notes for you guys. Um, there's also for the summit. There's uh, YouTube videos of I guess your worship services, um, yeah. um, and some yeah the keynotes yeah. for those. So those will be uh, uh, fun for people to to listen to and to watch. Absolutely, and I will say, and I don't know if I've said this very much in public, but Summit Two is coming. <gasps> awesome. We're going to have another summit, and it's going to be focused on the doctrine of holiness. Oh, oh. my goodness. That's fantastic. I'm going to have to go get a PhD before now and then so I can show up. <laughs> That's right. You, hey, here's, here's something. If you would like on-site podcasting of what's going on, I know three guys who, would be, who are open to that. Listen, I'm just saying. Uh, let me also add to that. If you, if you want to go to the summit and feel like you're at a rock concert and, and there are groupies for all of your participants that will ask for their autographs, 
we will also do that. <laughs> <laughs> that we'll throw signs that say, holiness, holiness. <laughs> nerd alert, nerd alert. <laughs> no, there is no um, shame, brother man. No, there you know, is no. Uh, you know, we had a lot of people who wanted to come to the summit. And I had to say no. Um, yeah. But mainly I told them, you will be bored. <laughs> <laughs> So we just got shot down in public. Air. <laughs> yes, we did. Okay. No, no problem. I'm, we're looking forward to. I'm, I just I love the work you're doing, and your heart more than anything. Yeah. Um. I, thank you for being with us today. It's been a huge blessing, and I hope for everybody as we get set on, uh, the faith once delivered. Absolutely. Amen. Well, thank you, Dr. Danker. We appreciate you being with us. Y'all go check them out um, at nextmethodism.org and follow him at Ryan N. Danker um, on social media. We're so um, happy to have you and um, that you're a friend of the podcast now. So uh, we look forward to um, having you on again. Thanks so much. All right. Talk to you later.